Well, I don't know about you, but I got my ballot in the mail yesterday. When I opened it up, there are 13 statewide ballot issues uh, that we have to vote on, plus nine uh, local issues here in Boulder County. So our program today is uh, particularly uh, timely, and uh, it's also a challenging one because our speaker is going to try to cover all 13 of the statewide issues in a fair and balanced way in 30 minutes' time. Um, at our house, we have a, a stack uh, in, a, in a corner of all the different ballot guides we've uh, uh, received. And um, today, you're going to get an in-person uh, ballot guide in addition to all those uh, printed ones. Uh, so we want you to come away uh, being educated. We are not today going to be advocating at all for any of them. Uh, in fact, uh, for the questions uh, at the end of Patrick's talk, on your table there, is, uh, there are index cards. If you have a question that occurs to you at any time during the talk, uh, go ahead and write them down, hold them up, and Janet Beardsley or Gary Kahn will come around and pick them up and pass them uh, on to me for uh, uh, presenting to Patrick at the end. So our speaker today is Patrick Patyandi. He is a Mellon Foundation and American Council of Learned Societies Public Fellow. What's that? Uh, the, uh, uh, these two organizations have come together to place PhDs in the humanities in uh, government positions or nonprofit positions. In other words, to help them uh, in, uh, get into non-traditional non academic uh, fields. So Patrick has a, a two-year appointment at the National Conference of State Legislatures, the organization that I worked at for 40 years, uh, 40 plus years, that's headquartered in uh, Denver. Patrick uh, covers uh, uh, statewide ballot measures all across the country, tracks all of them. He also covers uh, the 2020 census, uh, the citizen initiative process, and civic education. Patrick uh, uh, graduated from University of Colorado and has a PhD from Ohio State University. So please welcome Patrick. Uh, hello, thanks for having me today. Um, as uh, we just noted, um, there are 13 statewide ballot measures across Colorado. It is the most of any state. Um, California technically has, ha will have had more than us, but they got a vote on five back in their primary election earlier. So we have the most on a single ballot. So that's why when you get that uh, ballot in the mail, it's going to be a little thicker than all the others. Um, and here I've called uh, this the Colorado Talking Purple primer. primer. Um, you get that blue book uh, created by the Legislative Council in the mail. Um, this one, uh, I'm also wearing my purple tie here, my, bi my uh, bipartisan tie, although NCSL is nonpartisan, so if you're a member of a minor party, my apologies. Um, this is as good as I could do. So um, I'm going to try to cover all 13 measures, and hopefully if we have time, I'll just give you a little bit of a taste on the national measures I cover as well. Across the country, there's 170 total statewide measures. That's not counting the local ones or anything like that. So here we go. Try to stay with me. Um, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So uh, here we have uh, quick notes on Colorado's process here, right? Um, I think I might take this and just move around a little bit so I can make sure uh, I'm covering everything here. So uh, to do a constitutional amendment, you need to do, uh, get 55% of the vote to pass it, but you only need 50% to overturn a previously passed one. To pass a statutory initiative, a proposition, you only need that simple majority, 50%, right? Okay. Um, once a statute is passed by the citizens, a statutory citizen initiative, right, the propositions, the legislature can go and change those right away. They can amend them or, or overdo them all completely. Um, 
Also, this round, that geographic requirement that you had to collect signatures from across Colorado was in effect, although it's being challenged in court. So we can talk about that later, or you can always contact me after this too. Happy to answer questions later on. So Amendment V, State Senator Assembly Age. Um, here we have on, the, on this side here, we have 19 bolded at age 25, and we have uh, the number 26 bolded at age 21 going across for age in terms of where, that's where Colorado falls across the scale. This amendment would lower the age for a state senator down to 21. Okay, this one's pretty basic. I'm going to move past it pretty quickly, right? Amendment V, you have your pros. You have voters can judge whether a candidate can possesses a maturity. You can uh, judge that on your own, right? That's the idea here, right? That you don't have to wait till someone's a certain age to, to, to run. You allow younger candidates, you're going to increase their civic participation, their engagement in the process, right? On the con side, we have younger candidates may lack the maturity, right, needed in the expertise to be effective legislators, right? That sort of an idea is that, you know, that's why we also have a certain age limit to be president or things like that. So next we're going to move on to uh, Judge Judy, right? Um, but only sort of, that's just a hook. Amendment W, ballot format for judicial retention. This seems pretty dry, but it's actually really important. So in 1966, the Constitutional Amendment repealed the partisan election of judges. It replaced it by a judicial nomination com commission. And now we vote every uh, in even numbered years to retain them or not. So what this amendment would do is here you have on this side closest to me, you have what the ballot looks like right now. We have to have the whole question put out for each judge. And it makes that ballot longer. What if you approve of this amendment, it'll be a much shorter ballot. You'll take off about 33%, give or take, of that ballot. So it'll essentially say, shall we, uh, you know, keep these Colorado Supreme Court justices? Yes, no for each of those or the Court of Appeals justices. Well, that seems pretty minor, right? For a large county, you're going to save about $100,000 potentially in terms of printing costs and things like that, right? Elections are very expensive. It's going to reduce that ballot size, which will possibly lead to less ballot drop-off for people, right? The longer a ballot you have, you actually lose voters as they go along. They say, yeah, I'm going to make vote for these. And then, well, you got somewhere to go. So, you know, you move along, right? So you have a shorter ballot, so it might keep people around to vote on everything. Um, the con side there, uh, we have, uh, and many of these pros and cons have kind of taken from actual proponents or opponents um, as they've been quoted either officially or in news sources and things like that. Um, someone's argued that this is a solution in search of a problem. It might lead to voter confusion. And you can kind of see maybe that right on that other side here. You kind of see, well, should I be voting for just Robert Smith or Maria? Or should I be voting for both of them? Yes on both. Or maybe yes on just one of them. Something like that, right? So you can maybe see that. Next, we're going to move along to, does anyone know what, this, what these are? Hemp seeds. So this is Amendment X, Changing Industrial Hemp Definition. This is another one of those that uh, maybe seems not too important, right? What it's going to do here, and here we can actually get a taste of, of how some policy making is actually done. We're going to take out the old definition, that's the crossed out portion, and we're going to put in these uh, all capital letters at the bottom. That industrial hemp will have the same meaning as it is defined in federal law or as the term is defined in Colorado State statute. So you still leave it open for the Colorado legislature to, to define it further in there. Why does this matter? In 2014, Colorado had 200 acres in hemp production. In 2017, it had almost 10,000 acres in hemp production. Um, and you can do all sorts of things with hemp, I'm told. You can create construction materials, you can eat it, you can do all sorts of stuff with it. So there's pending federal legislation to remove industrial hemp from that Controlled Substances Act. Right now it's treated the same way as the type of marijuana that gets you high, right? We're, they're potentially going to change that, which would make it even more open for states to produce this, right? So the pros, it allows Colorado's hemp industry to remain competitive with other states as the regulatory landscape evolves for this crop. I believe New Mexico just did a change like this last year. Con is that Colorado voters added the current definition as it is, that part that's getting crossed out, Colorado voters added that in. Um, and so this change so quickly might kind of deviate from voters' intentions, right? Next, we're going to move to redistricting. And there are two measures on the ballot here. There's uh, Amendment Y, which is for congressional redistricting, right? Our U.S. House members. Right now, we have seven seats. Uh, it is estimated that Colorado is likely to gain another one um, after the 2020 census, which is one of the things I cover. Um, and my uh, colleague, Wendy Underhill, who really is one of the top experts in redistricting in the nation, works at NCSL too. Um, she's kind of said that 
it's, it's not so much carving something out of the existing map. What they'll probably do is start fresh if they get that added seat and completely redo a map. So it's kind of impossible to say where that will end up. So there's Amendment Y for Congressional Redistricting. There's also Amendment Z for Legislative Redistricting, redistricting the state legislative seats. Right now we have 35 senators and 65 representatives at that state legislative level, the folks I serve in my position at NCSL. So here's our current maps here. What does this look like? Both of these measures would create a redistricting commission. A lot of times you'll hear this called an independent redistricting commission, but that independent word can kind of mean different things to different people. So you have an applicant pool. You'd have a, over a thousand people in this applicant pool. And this would be split up among Democrats, um, Republicans, and unaffiliated. And that is a key term here, an important term. Um, and it's not necessarily Democrats, Republicans in that, in that measure. It's the two largest parties. Right now it's Democrats, and Republicans. Colorado currently is split in terms of registrations, roughly a third Democrats, a third Republicans, and a third unaffiliated slash independents. Um, and to get in that applicant pool, you have to meet some minimum requirements. Then how do we select these? We have 12 members on each commission, right? There'll be two commissions, it'll be separate. You'll have four Democrats, four Republicans, and four unaffiliated. A panel of three judges will essentially select six of the members, six of the 12, and then um, the other six will essentially be by lot or by chance. And actually kind of did some investigation to see what they meant by lot. Um, it's not defined, so they might pick names out of a hat. They might do any sorts of things like that. Um, then for drawing lines, once you have those commissions, right, they'll have to meet some criteria. They'll have to have things like equal population, communities of interest, compactness. These are criteria that you see in maps across the country when you have to go do redistricting every 10 years after that census, right? All the states do that after each census. It will also add, maximize, it'll maximize political competitiveness. That's what the instructions are, right? And this is a newer kind of reform for redistricting across the country for uh, reform advocates, right? They want to have that political competitiveness. And if you've tracked the Supreme Court cases that deal with redistricting recently, a lot of the debate was around how do you actually define competitiveness? Can we define that? What's a good way to do that? Then the maps will also be drawn by nonpartisan legislative staff, and then the commissions will kind of approve those. There will also be a, a point for public transparency and public input, things like that involved. The legislature still has a hand in those commissions. They put forth some of the applicants that the judges will choose from, um, but the judges still choose uh, the, some of those commission members. So the pros and cons here for both of these, I've kind of lumped both X, uh, Y and Z together. We have wide Republican and Democrat support. These are both legislatively referred measures. It means the legislature went and put them on the ballot for us to vote on as amendments. Um, both they came out of, they came sponsored from both the House and Senate leaders of both the Republican and Democratic parties. The state parties have endorsed them, things like that. Uh, the pros here are limits that it might limit the role of partisan politics. It might encourage more political compromise. Um, it might make the redistricting process more transparent, and they're arguing that there will be clear, ordered, and fair criteria, although especially that competitiveness one, that one is still kind of up for debate, possibly, more so than some of the others that have been litigated a lot more. On the con side, you might deny involvement by minority party members, right? To be in that pool, you need to be unaffiliated. You can't be a Green Party member or something like that. So judges will also pick some members, and those three judges are going to be retired judges, and I think ideally there will be a Republican, a Democrat, and an unaffiliated. So again, you're having that spread, but you may not like the kind of influence that, that three judges will have on the process. And then commission members may be unaccountable, right? If when the legislature draws the map, your state legislature draws the map, and you don't like it, right, you can hold them accountable at the ballot box, right? You can't really do that with these three judges or the commission after they pick the maps, arguably. Amendment A, remove exception for slavery and involuntary servitude. Currently, right now, there's a phrase that says you can't have slavery and voluntary servitude except as punishment for a crime. And so a yes vote supports this proposal to remove part of that Colorado Constitution that says slavery and involuntary servitude are allowed for punishment as a crime. And this might sound familiar to you. Voters voted on this in 2016. It narrowly failed. Um, proponents of that 2016 measure and many of the same proponents of this measure have argued that the, the ballot language on that was very confusing. They essentially used the double negative in that measure. And so folks were kind of confused. They think some people who wanted to vote 
uh, to get rid of it, maybe voted for it. So the pros we have this measure eliminates slavery and voluntary servitude in all, circ in all circumstances, right? What could possibly be the con of that, you might ask. Um, it's, there's some questions about the possibility of legality of forced community service, right, in terms of the criminal justice system, and also uh, in some prison work requirements, right? Um, and so there's kind of some more weedsy policy debates in terms of what that might change in terms of what Colorado's prisons uh, are allowed to, to function as. Amendment 73, education funding. This one is immensely complicated, so I really am giving you, you know, the two-cent version of this one. So this one's worth it to go find that blue book and really look at it a little bit. So this would increase income taxes for individuals with incomes above $150,000 per year in a graduated uh, bracket system, right? A graduated income tax system. It would increase the corporate tax rate a little bit right there. It would reduce residential and non-residential property rates. It would create the quality education fund, which would essentially then dedicate the funds it creates towards public education in, in certain areas. And it tells you where that money goes in that fund. So some of the pros here that we have, it would increase funding per pupil spending, right? That kind of dollar amount that you see, how much does this county or this state spend per pupil? It's gonna increase that amount. It's gonna increase special ed, English as a second language, gifted programs and preschool funding across um, in various levels. So you can kind of go and see how much it does each of those. It'll help address inequities in Cardo's current tax system. These are what proponents are saying, right? And it'll stabilize the volatile local share of education funding by first lowering property tax rates and freezing those rates at this 7% figure. Again, it's changing many moving parts in this measure. Um, and they point out that these are the third lowest in the nation, right? And you might have fallen some of those teacher strike issues, right? This is an issue that kind of came out of those, right? The cons though, right? We have one income tax rate that is replaced by six brackets, right? Some folks don't like the idea of that. The measure imposes a tax increase without any guarantee of increased academic achievement, right? This is that question of are we just throwing money at public institutions without any kind of um, guarantee that we're going to actually improve things. And we're going to increase the state income tax rate that that could negatively impact the state's economy, right? Amendment 75 is campaign contribution limits initiative. Um, this one's a little complicated, but fairly direct. If a candidate puts a million dollars or more towards their own campaign in various ways, then the other candidate in the same statewide race can essentially accept five times as much contributions from individuals, right? So what does that mean? So we have current limits for governor. You can give $575 in the primary, and you can give them $575 again in the general election for a total of a little over $1,000, right, total? Let's say you have a candidate who puts a million dollars of their own money in, right? Then you can take individual contributions five times that for a total of $5,750 for governor, right? That primary and then that general election each time. And that applies to any of the statewide races. So we have state house of representative limits, state uh, senate limits, and then what that would look like if this, if this measure passes, right? So this one is kind of an interesting one too because you know you hear a lot of talk about big money in politics and things like that. So this one in terms of the pros, it's aimed at leveling that playing field. Um, in terms of if you have like a really wealthy candidate against someone who doesn't have that sort of resources. And then candidates who rely on individual contributions are really at a significant advantage when they run against someone like that. The con here though is that this, further, this measure further complicates a system without necessarily, right, uh, addressing financial disparities among candidates. And this increase in campaign contribution limits further inflates election spending. If your problem that you see with elections is too much money in politics, this isn't addressing that, right? This essentially is more addressing if one candidate has the funds to just put a lot of their own money towards it, then you can kind of increase the ability of the other candidate to raise money, right? It's solving a very, it's, it's addressing a specific issue, not necessarily the one you think it might be at first. Amendment 74, compensating landowners is the basic title I've given this one. Um, this one requires that property owners be compensated for any reduction in property value caused by any state laws or regulations. Um, you've probably seen op-eds about this one. Uh, this one is very far-reaching. Um, I really am not hyper using hyperbole when I say that this one is really big. So there, right now, some just some context in this kind of general issue. There are existing three ways that the state or local government can take and compensate private property, right? 
So we have eminent domain, that's the thing we probably hear most about, but we also have intentional accidental damage on part of the state, and we also have things like zoning, right, that kind of regulatory taking, right, if you reduce your property value by saying you can't build three-story apartment complexes here, whatever it is, right? And this one, it's kind of important to note too here, I've paired this one with my next uh, uh, measure here. This is really in response to Proposition 112, which we'll go over in a second. So the pros here, and this is, uh, so the pro is when a government takes action or the values of property is only fair, that right, we compensate that property owner, right? That sounds reasonable. And for many Coloradans, property is the most significant asset they own, right? Especially, you know, if you're a homeowner, things like that. Um, or a farmer, say, right? That land is really where your value is. Um, the con side, uh, a state has tried this before, right? In NCSL, a lot of times we look at kind of state examples of, of how that's worked. So over the course of three years, Oregon faced 7,000 lawsuits, totally nearly $20 billion um, uh, uh, all across against local governments and state government um, after it passed its measure. Um, it then repealed it. Um, the numerous lawsuits and costs could essentially cripple state and local governments um, and a possible, and this one then in response, as a response to 112, which we'll go over next, this is a constitutional amendment change, which is harder to institute, but also harder to get rid of, um, in response to a statutory proposition, okay? So if that goes into your equation at all. So Proposition 112 is this is new oil and gas setbacks. This is the one you've probably seen either mailings at your house or billboards or I've seen it on people's cars. This one probably is getting the most attention. Um, this would require a 2,500 foot buffer around quote, occupied structures or vulnerable areas. Um, and vulnerable areas here are listed as things like rivers and streams and playgrounds. They list a bunch of stuff in that. It's a lot of things. So this would essentially make 54% of land would be unavailable. Um, across all of Colorado, and that's roughly 85% of non-federal land, right? Because we have a lot of federal land here in our mountain areas. So this is applying to state land, right? Um, and these numbers come from an industry source. No one else has done a study like this, um, I figure, but it's been widely quoted in the media, so I wanted to share it, but also note where the source is coming from. So current state regulations, we have a 500-foot foot setback instead of a 2,500 one from a home or occupied building and 1,000 feet from things like schools and hospitals. So a little bit of a change there, right, as you can see. So we have pros and cons here, right? The pros are kind of what you might think, right? Folks are concerned about environmental protection. They're uh, concerned about safety in general, right? Um, they have claimed that the, the governing body, governing oil and gas development, hasn't listened to some of their complaints and concerns over time, right? The folks who could change those setbacks on their own. And some people are reluctant, they argue, are, might not purchase property when they don't know how close oil and gas and things are going to be. The cons here is that we'll have a great loss of economic development and jobs, we'll lose some tax revenue. Um, they argue that existing, that existing setback is already reasonable, right? We already have, have something set there. And we already have this body that has the authority to change that. And if we want to change that, we already have a process in place for that, right? Proposition 111, this is uh, a limitation on payday loans. Um, and so just quickly remember, uh, kind of review here for folks, uh, if we're a little unfamiliar, these are short-term high-interest loans that usually folks pay back at their next paycheck, right? Um, and it's a lending option for folks that may not be able to afford traditional banks or credit unions or things like that, right? Um, I need $300 to fix my car, but I don't have anything in my bank account, so I'm going to go leverage my next paycheck with a payday loan place, something like that. So now a little bit of context on this one as well. In 2010, Colorado actually reformed its payday lo uh, loan laws. Um, and here we see from left to right, we see 2007 to 2016, the number of deferred deposits slash payday loans, okay? After the 2010 reform, we see it go from about a little over a million, a million 100,000, down to about 450,000, right? And this was a reduction in things like the percentages you can charge for a payday loan. After this reform, this is what this would look like. So if I borrow $500 under the current law, I would likely pay, and this is coming from the 2018, that blue book I mentioned, right? I would likely pay about $800 for that loan. After this uh, Proposition 111, I would pay about $553 back to loan that money. Um, that may sound pretty good, right? The cons here, though, right, is that the measure rest may restrict the ability of payday lenders to operate at all, right? They're offering fairly risky loans to folks, and they need to be able to kind of uh, operate in that space. 
Pros though, we have this reduces the current maximum allowable charge down to 36% APR. About 11 states have that 36% uh, limit right now. It expands what constitutes unfair and deceptive practices. It attacks what's sometimes called a cycle of debt amongst folks, right? Um, some folks see this as predatory lending. But again, right, in the con side that this is offering a needed service amongst part of the community, right? They don't have access to traditional banks and the like. So the final two measures here in Colorado, we have Fix Our Damn Roads in 109, as it's titled amongst uh, proponents, and we also have Let's Go Colorado 110. Um, first one, I'm going to kind of present these together. They are not necessarily competing. Colorado voters could pass both of these, and actually the state legislature would have some figuring out to do on what to do about that. 109 would do $3.5 billion of bonds. It does not have a mechanism necessarily in place of increased revenue to pay for those bonds. Where that money would come from is existing general fund dollars, which means you would be taking some money from some other things to pay back those bonds in the future. 110 gives you $6 billion in bonds, but does a tax increase um, by 0.62% from 2.9% to 3.5% uh, increase in the state sales tax for 20 years to pay back those bonds. So that's kind of the key basic of those, right? And here we have a little more context is, again, from 1991, we had 3 million people living here. We were paying about $125 to upkeep our roads. That's how much the state was spending. Then in 2015, we had 5.4 million people, and we were spending about $68 to keep up our roads. Now we have 7 point, in 2040, we'd have 7.8 million people, and if we keep spending where it's at right now, we'd only have about $41. Per, uh, per person. This, and, and I'm hoping to kind of make this uh, presentation available to folks who want it, and we can find this online for you too. These are the kind of what the budget might look like depending on which one is passed. So the first one is essentially what uh, uh, the state has said they need to do their roads, right? Um, so we have about, they want about $10 billion, right, over the course of, of 20 years. If 2018, and if the 2018 Proposition 110 passes, this first bar here, you'd get very close to that, to that number. Um, and the other colors are coming from some other sources, right, um, that, that we don't quite have time to go into. So if 110 passes, you'll get very close to meeting that mark of what the state says they need for transportation. If 109 passes, you'll be about halfway there. Um, if both fail, they plan to do a 2019 ballot measure to try to keep getting funding, and you'd end up at this next graph. And if both of them fail and we fail in 2019, um, then there is a SB 267, a Senate bill, that would try to fill some of those gaps here in terms of funding. So the state legislature has actually been really proactive on this and kind of been planning on what happens if both pass, one passes, they don't pass, and we have to try something next year. They've really been thinking that through. So what do we have pros and cons? I've done cons for both of these since essentially they both seek to fund transportation, right? So in that 109, Fix Our Damn Roads, the smaller bond package, right, that would take from the general fund, it's a modest bond commitment, but without any source of revenue necessarily to pay for it. And it's possibly not enough to fund or fix the roads, right, if we look at this graph. But for 110, it's a much larger bond commitment, right? And it increases the sales tax a little bit for 20 years, right? So there's lots of things to balance with both of these. Again, you could pass them both, or you could pass neither, or you could vote for one or the either. So um, looking at Carl here, do we still have a few minutes? All right, we still got a few minutes. So I'm just going to really briefly give you some kind of national themes and trends here. Um, I cover all the ballot measures across the states. Only 24 states actually allow a citizen initiative for folks to go around and collect signatures to put something on the ballot, but all the states through their legislature can place things on the ballot. So actually, I end up having to track all the states to do this, and plus Washington, D.C., we track as well. So, so far, I kind of mentioned California voted on some measures. Um, some other states have two. Twelve have been voted on. Ten have passed, two have failed, right? And again, we'll, we can circulate this later. Um, one redistricting commission uh, bill was, was passed in Ohio, and it did both legislative and congressional districts. In terms of big themes, elections redistricting is really big this year. This year, there are more redistricting ballot measures um, on our ballots than there have been since uh, 2010 all the other years combined, right? In elections, we have lots of elections-related measures. Sometimes we'll see a couple across the country, but now we see lots of those happening, things like automatic voter registration, um, felon reenfranchisement, voter, 
photo voter ID. We also see nine states are considering ethics or campaign finance and lobbying issues as well, kind of on a related category. Medicaid in the states is another big issue that you might have seen in the news a little bit. Three states will vote on whether to expand it fully, um, and two other states will essentially be figuring out how when the states are going to essentially take over more of the funding responsibility for Medicaid as the years progress, they're kind of figuring out how to fund those, and Oregon passed theirs earlier in January. We see kind of two themes here. We see raising tax revenue in some states, right? Colorado, we're seeing that with that education initiative. Maine, we're seeing that to fund health care. California is doing homelessness prevention, and we see lots of other things going on. You know, do we want to raise taxes to support various services? We also see a theme, though, in trying to limit tax revenue, or at least the ability to raise tax revenue. Florida and Oregon, you may require a two-thirds or a three-fifths vote in the legislature to raise taxes, that sort of thing. Um, uh, California might require voter approval to raise future gas taxes, those sorts of issues. There's a number of those across the country. And uh, just a couple last slides here. Energy and environmental protection is a big theme this year. A couple states are looking at requiring 50% renewable energy by 2030. Those, uh, those two measures are pushed by the same organization. Wisconsin, uh, Washington rather, not Wisconsin, would be the country's first fee on carbon emissions, and that one's gotten a little bit of attention too. Um, and then various other kind of interesting ones. There's an interesting one in Alaska kind of pitting salmon water protection versus uh, industry there. Other notables, and this is kind of the last uh, national slide here, we have abortion restriction me measures in Alabama, Oregon, and West Virginia. Uh, Alabama will also uh, reconsider placing the Ten Commandments on public property. Um, Massachusetts is going to look at that kind of bathroom bill, gender discrimination sort of issue through a referendum. Um, we have our payday lending, Colorado. Um, Oregon's going to look at both uh, whether their police should essentially enforce federal immigration laws this is sometimes referred to as sanctuary state or sanctuary city issue, depending on which side of the aisle you're on. Um, the pink tax prohibition in Nevada is part of a larger trend. This would ban taxes on feminine hygiene products, and this is part of a larger measure that legislatures are taking up. There's a gun safety and a police reform measure in Washington. They're two separate ones. Those could be really interesting. And the school voucher expansion veto in Arizona is getting a lot of attention and a lot of... Uh, uh, protests and things on both sides of that aisle. And then also, if we can circulate this later, I have some resources that folks can find online. Thanks. You, you, you actually did it, Patrick. Uh, 13 issues in 30 minutes. Uh, we uh, thank you for your questions. We're pretty much out of time, uh, so I'm just going to share one of them, uh, actually combine Sorry about them. That. Um, <laughs> Uh, combine two of them, uh, which are very similar. One of them is, is it a good idea to have uh, so many complex ballot measures on the ballot? Uh, and another is, with the proliferation of amendments to state constitutions, is there any chance of constitutional conventions to refine and get back to basics and have legislatures deal with the rest? Those are, those are good questions, especially for uh, an NCSL representative here. Um, uh, back in 2002, NCSL did actually a study of the initiative process and uh, it had some recommendations for states when they're considering this. Um, there are definitely pros and cons to the decision and the process. And one of those cons, right, is that you don't go through a legislative process. The legislative process is very deliberate. It's not overly fast, right? You have to really consider things. You make sure that Pros and cons are heard from both sides and all the issues, right? You can go in and testify yourself. If you're an organization, you can go in and testify, and legislators will go and kind of listen to those concerns and then kind of maybe amend and change the bill, and eventually you get to a compromise, and legislation is made, and then the governor vetoes, and you got to go and change it. All right. But anyways, you go through this very deliberate process, right? With the citizen initiative process, right? Um, you know, me and Carl could say, hey, let's go change something. We really hate, you know, when tractors drive down a road. So we go and collect signatures on that. Um, and, you know, that's great. We're volunteering our time. We don't have a lot of money. Um, but a lot of times big interests can also kind of essentially use the citizen initiative process to use that as leverage against the legislature and force them to act a certain way. Um, a lot of times citizen initiative processes won't go through any kind of review. It'll just kind of say, well, this seems like a good idea. And then if the voters kind of say, oh, that seems okay. That's part of another question, right, too, is that voter education on issues may be limited, right? We all have jobs and kids and responsibilities and things to do that, you know, I would be very surprised if a majority of people go and read their whole blue book, right? So 
are voters really in the best position to do things like amending the Constitution, um, or, you know, let alone passing statutes? The other question then, too, is in terms of a convention, right, is some states actually have every 20 years, um, Hawaii has this, New York has this, those are the only two that are coming to mind, where essentially it's an automatic referral to the ballot is do the voters want to do a constitutional convention to redo it? Um, New York turned theirs down last year, um, and I don't know quite the history of, of how many times states have actually done that, um, but Hawaii is voting on it this year. Um, and so that's one, you know, that is a possibility to always redo your constitution, right? Um, one of the great things about the United States of America. So, um, you know, you can do that. Uh, but from an NCSL perspective and in terms of kind of as you're thinking it through, um, you know, it is worth taking some of your time, especially looking at, you know, that education measure, the redistricting measures. A lot of these are really complex. Um, and in some ways, sometimes, arguably, some of the measures are making things more complicated rather than simpler or aren't that direct really at the end of the day, even if they seem like it. So uh, that would be my long-winded response to that question. Patrick Patyandi, um, you have just set the world's record for most substance covered in 30 minutes Thank you. in any forum anywhere. <laughs> um, we're very grateful to you, and, and we wish that we could present you 10 more times between now and Election Day. I don't think we can do that. But in your honor, the Boulder Rotary Club uh, is pleased to contribute 100 doses of vaccine to the Polio Plus Fund. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. Thank you.